All right, and welcome. Uh, so Kat Pereira started Ada Developers in fall of 2018 as part of Cohort 10. Uh, they did their internship at High Spot uh, and have been there for the last two years working as a software engineer. And Maria Terehina is a front end developer at High Spot and an accessibility advocate. So I'll turn it over to them and I will put the Slack channel in the chat. So if you have questions or comments, you can feel free to use the chat function here or in the Slack. Thank you for introduction. Let's get started. Happy Friday, everyone. My name is Marie, and today with my amazing co-speaker, Kat, we're going to share um, our perspective on why accessibility is important and why you should become an accessibility advocate. The goal of this presentation is not to feed all the digital accessibility knowledge in 20 minutes, because frankly, it's impossible. Instead, we hope to ignite a spark of passion around accessibility and encourage you to adopt uh, an accessibility first approach in your current or future roles. Let me ask you a question first. Which diagram represents the United States adult population accurately? A, with 13% of people living with at least one permanent disability, B with 26% or C with four. You can post your responses in the chat and Kat help, can help me to read your responses. Uh, B, 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 C, B, okay. B, 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 okay. <laughs> okay. okay. And A. People who Sorry. responded be uh, correct. And here are some sobering statistics. According to the CDC, every fourth, adult in the United States lives with at least one permanent disability, which is equal to about 61 million people. In the world, this number is close to 1 billion people. Let's pause here. 1 billion people. 1 billion people to live their life to the fullest and function successfully in modern society need some sort of assistive technology or adaptive tools such as hearing aids, mobility aids, glasses, screen readers, tools to comprehend text, to write text, ad blockers, etc. They also need an accessible web. And now I'm going to pass to Kat. Thank you, Maria. Um, okay, so have you ever had an experience where you visit a website, and you're looking to do something like find a phone number, and after spending a few minutes clicking around, things were just too complicated, things were all over the screen, you couldn't find it, and you just gave up? Or were you able to find the phone number, but you left a page really angry and annoyed at the page that you were just on? Yeah, uh, this is an example of how you hit a barrier. The content that you needed was not accessible to you. Everyone is unique and people have diverse abilities, a different range of skills, use different tools and have different expectations that can cause different barriers showing themselves in websites. For example, I use contacts and glasses to help me to see small things clearly from a distance. I have trouble pronouncing certain letters and words, and I sometimes have to repeat myself to be understood. Some images and content will trigger disassociation, which causes me to lose focus and experience brain fog. Websites that contain visual, speech, and cognitive barriers may affect my experience on the website. It can feel impossible to create web content that is accessible to everyone. Trying to create a perfect web experience for every single one of your users is pretty much impossible. Uh, there are five major areas where people face barriers to accessibility. These five areas are auditory, physical, speech, visual, and cognitive. These are umbrella terms and are helpful when thinking about users collectively, but individual human experiences are varied and unique and don't fit completely into every category. But by intentionally thinking through the main areas that users face, you can start to craft unique solutions to your features and designs that lower some of the barriers, eliminate frustrations, and build a space that is more pleasant and open for everyone. So I'm going to dive into each of these areas and explain a bit more about what they are, some users who are affected, and common barriers on the web that people face. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to start with auditory. A person with an auditory disability is defined as a person who experiences mild to moderate hearing loss in one or both ears. Some examples to barriers of barriers include lack of transcripts, no captions, 
web-based services with actions that rely on voice alone, and media players that do not provide volume control. Users affected may include those with permanent severe hearing loss, such as deafness. People suffering from temporary hearing loss are also affected. An example would be someone who is slowly losing their hearing with age. It's also momentary or situational hearing loss, and that's another factor. An example of this would be a person who has broken headphones or someone who is in a loud space, like on a train, who cannot hear things clearly. On the right side is a picture of a closed captioned button. Adding the option to read captions can help lower barriers for folks who experience an auditory disability. Next slide, please. A person with a physical disability or a motor disability includes those with a weakness in muscular control, joint disorders, limited sensations, and missing limbs. Users who are affected by physical barriers can be people with permanent disabilities, people who have an injury, like someone with a sprained wrist, or it could be situational, like when a user is standing on the bus during commute and can only use their phone with one hand. Examples of barriers include websites and browsers without full keyboard support, tasks with time limits, complicated or incomplete tab stops, and controls that do not have equivalent text alternatives. So a common experience here is users that can't use a mouse and use a tab key to navigate through a site. Developers can run emulator tools like aim tab stop to make sure that their paths make sense. The image on this slide uh, shows the amazon.com header and the tabs repeat over the same line, making things confusing and can cause barriers to content for folks with physical disabilities. Next slide, please. A person who faces speech barriers is someone whose volume of speech or clarity of words may be difficult to understand by most software. Examples of some barriers could be voice only interactions or a website that offers phone numbers to communicate, only phone numbers to communicate with the organization. A person affected by these barriers may have a permanent condition or they might have a temporary condition like a sore throat. It could also be situational, like they might have a sleeping child in the room and they can't speak loudly, or the person might be in a space where it is unsafe to talk or use their voice. On the right is a picture of a site where the only way to contact customer service is through the phone. This can cause barriers for folks with speech disabilities. Next slide, please. I'm gonna drink some water because this is a lot of talking for me. Hold on. Okay. So a person who, oh, visual. A person who faces visual barriers on the web is someone who experiences a range of mild to severe vision loss in one or both eyes. A person may also have a reduced or lack of sensitivity to some colors or an increased sensitivity to bright colors. A person affected permanently by these barriers may have full vision loss, color blindness, or experience light sensitivity. An example of someone who is temporarily affected is someone who has an eye infection causing blurry vision. Um, and some examples of situational vision loss includes users with a cracked device screen, uh, someone who is sitting in a very bright space, making it difficult to see colors on a screen, or a person who's driving can't look at their phone uh, but needs to communicate with an app. Images, controls, or structural elements without text alternatives can create barriers for folks who rely on screen lead readers. On the right is a photograph of Katrina from cohort 10. By including her name, pronouns, and cohort number in the alt tag, this helps to make this site more accessible for people with visual disabilities. Next slide, please. Last but not least on the list are people who face cognitive learning and neurological barriers on the web. This may affect how well people hear, move, speak, or understand information. By creating web experiences with a focus to eliminate some of the four barriers I talked about, uh, a lot of these issues faced by these, or a lot of the issues faced by these individuals may be resolved. More unique barriers include complex navigation and layouts that are difficult to understand or use, long passages of text without illustrations to add context, and moving bouncing things that cannot be turned off. Uh, examples of those permanently af affected include folks with ADHD, PTSD, and epilepsy. Examples of temporary disability include someone experiencing a headache or someone who had a bad night's sleep who is suffering, suffering from sleep deprivation. An example of a situational barrier could be a person in a foreign language site 
with no translations and it makes the site incomprehensible. On the right is a photograph of a site, uh, of a site with a recipe for banana bread. The recipe is hidden behind videos that cannot close large ad banners and pop-ups asking you to subscribe to something. This page is full of bar barriers for people who have learning and cognitive disabilities. So by developing features and websites while thinking through how each user, each of the users face barriers uh, in each of these categories experience the web, you can help to increase communication, successful interactions, and lessen feelings of frustrations in your users. So now I'm going to pass it back to Maria, who is going to share an example of how an inaccessible experience creates a barrier to content in a very painful way. Thank you, Kat. As you've just learned, many people cannot use a mouse because of either injury or inability to move their hand enough to control a mouse. These users will need to move systematically through a website by using their keyboard. I'm going to show you a video that demonstrates the difference between using a mouse and using a keyboard while doing the same task of ordering a card at usps.com, one of the top visited websites in the United States. And I'll try to narrate along the way. Okay, let's start with mouse navigation. So here's usps.com website. I go scroll down, I find a place where I can purchase card. I find the card that I like and I add it to cart. It took me six clicks to get to checkout page. And now keyboard navigation. So I'm start, I start tabbing, but if you cannot see where my uh, focus is, it's just because it's not really uh, visible. I try to use search because it's a, a very fast way to navigate through a website, but it doesn't seem to work. And I keep faithfully tabbing and I really don't know where I am on the page. And I'm at the carousel and keep tabbing. Okay. Now I'm on the page and I want to purchase the first card. And I start tabbing and I go through the main navigation. And now I uh, presumably somewhere on the left side of a screen going through filters. Okay, now I found the card that I wanna purchase and I keep tabbing and again, back to main navigation. Okay, add to cart. Now things should get simple, simpler, but I still keep tabbing and I have no idea what's going on. And finally, I got to checkout page. So as you just saw, I was able to achieve the goal, but it took me five, six times longer than via mouse. When tabbing, I often lost where I was on the page and going over and over through the main navigation without skipping was really annoying. And here's the deal. The USPS Post Office is an essential governmental service. Its main page has 100 automatically detected accessibility errors, including 22 critical ones. For example, the search box, as you just saw, doesn't work at all for keyboard only users. So it could have been prevented, but it's not because frankly, web accessibility is always put in a backlog. Most companies do the bare minimum to meet the requirements simply because accessibility is very hard to add onto something that is not accessible from the beginning. That is why today we want to encourage you when planning, designing, coding, and testing your new features to think about millions of people who would love to use your product, but they can't. The web was intended to be accessible for all. The creator of the web, Tim Berners-Lee said, the power of the web and its universality Access by anyone, regardless of disability, is an essential aspect, but the reality is green. The web aim has a project called One Million. They run automatic accessibility tests on the top million homepages, and what they found honestly breaks my heart. 98%, 98 of these one million homepages are partially or fully inaccessible, with 59 automatically detectable errors on average, 
and from year to year, this number is growing. Especially in the time of COVID, access to web is vital and sometimes is a matter of survival that many of us are left out. Accessibility is a part of equity and we want you to always remember that. So hopefully by now you have some ideas on why it is important to become an accessibility advocate. Here's a list of all the whys, but all boils down to one simple truth. It's just the right thing to do. Now I'm going uh, to pass to Kat to talk about how to become an accessibility advocate in your current and future roles. Thank you, Maria. Uh, so whether you are an engineer, product manager, designer, or quality assurance tester, everyone who works to build the web can help to lower some of the web accessibility barriers that people commonly face. Every project and organization is unique. Uh, your job is to find ways to incorporate various checks and practices to help lower some of the web accessibility barriers that the product you all make may create. I'm going to go through some ideas of things that folks can do by role to give examples of ways that this work can be shared across an organization. Product managers, you can build accessibility standards into your product in partnership with devs, clients, and make adhering to the standards part of the exit criteria. Sometimes following standards can lead to an increase in time needed by everyone to extend a feature in a way to make it accessible. You can make sure to scope time and people needed on the project accordingly. Designers should focus on the usability of a feature. You can run your mocks through accessibility check tools, providing things like alternative text in the specs, help define landmarks on the page, define tab order, along with the dev, dev. Make sure focus states are clearly visible. Design skip two mechanisms. You can file fit and finish tickets for devs if standards are not met. QA testers, you can use assistive tech like screen readers, do keyboard only checks and create testing suites designed specifically for each feature then file bugs accordingly. Engineers, you can make sure that the content you are building is usable under all conditions as you build. Run a couple of tools of choice to run automatic, automated accessibility checks as you dev in your local environments. Some companies include a checklist in their PR templates reminding devs of key things that they should remember to spot. When reviewing each other's code, look to spot errors that the automated tools can sometimes miss. While you might not be able to fix everything to 100% pass on a page, do your best to fix what you can, make note of the errors in a ticket or a log, share it out with your team. Develop with empathy. While you're working, ask yourself, how would a person who faces each of the barrier areas that I talked about before experience and perform an action on what you just built? When you see something problematic, do what you can, any small thing, to make it a little easier on people. Try not to think that it's all too expensive and not worth the fix because there are too many barriers. Just focus on one thing you can do and feel okay about having to walk away from something for the moment if time is not in your favor. Make note of the issues, learn from the experiences, keep trying again and moving forward with each new project. We have the power to shift thinking of this from being a thing that gets pushed to the side to something that is part of the standard building process. Next slide, please. Connecting and collaborating with other advocates can be a really great way to learn and share what you know with people outside of your projects. Join meetup groups, attend conferences and workshops like Nobility's Access You. Start an accessibility Slack channel at work and share articles and events that you find interesting. Listen to podcasts, watch YouTube videos. Um, a thing that Maria and I did last year was we participated in Nobility's Accessibility Internet Rally, where we were matched with a nonprofit organization, and we worked together with our team to build them a new site with an accessibility first focus. I think that the most important thing that we can leave you all with is the desire to learn more and get excited to try to incorporate some of what we talked about into your everyday work. Uh, next slide, please. So please feel free to reach out to us on the ADCon Slack channel. We have shared out a link to a GitHub repository filled with a variety of resources to help guide you all on your journey to learn more. Thank you all so much.